Welcome to lecture 5.1, Symmetric Cryptographic Ciphers. In this lecture, we'll see how to send encoded messages, which will be numbers. And by this, I mean that we can encode any word as a number in base 26. So A corresponds to 0, B to 1, C to 2, and so forth. And of course, we can expand this if we want to include extra characters like spaces or punctuation marks. For example, in base 26, the word Clemson, C-L-E-M-S-O-N, can be encoded as 2, 11, 4, 12, 18, 14, 13. Now, of course, we don't want to just save this string because we don't want to have spaces everywhere. So we can convert it to decimal or base 10. Now, there are several ways to do that. Let me refresh your memory about different bases, and I'll just do this with an example. So in binary, consider 1, 0, 1, 1, and what that corresponds to is this, the first one is the ones digit, which is 2 to the 0, and the next dig digit is 2 to the first, and the third digit is 2 squared, and, the, and then the fourth one, or the first one, however you're counting, is 2 cubed. So this is 1 times 2 cubed plus 0 times 2 squared plus 1 times 2 to the first plus 1 times 2 to the 0, which is 8 plus 0 plus 2 plus 1, which is 11. Now we are reading things right to left, so left here, and by that I mean the 1's digit is to the right, and then we're going left. But if we're sending a message like this, we're reading in the digits left to right. And we don't a priori know how many digits there's going to be, so we don't really know where to start. This first digit, is this 26 to the third or 26 to the sixth, or, or what is it? So it probably makes a little bit more sense to call this first digit the 26 to the, the first, or the, sorry, the, the zeroth. Uh, that's the ones digit. And then the 20, this is 26 to the first. This is... 26 squared, this is 26 cubed, and 26 to the fourth, and so on. And if we do that, then this word Clemson, which is 2, 11, 4, 12, 18, 14, 13, those digits appear 2, 11, 4, 12, 18, 14, 13 right there. And when we multiply this out in base, oh, well, this base 26 number, again, a little abnormally reading it, le reading it left to right instead of right to left in base 10 is 41906838248. And hey, look at that. Um, 4190, that's actually the number of this course at Clemson University. We can reverse this process by recursively dividing 26 into the number. Now, this is something you've probably seen before, but you're also probably not familiar with it because it's not really an everyday thing that we do. But let's, let's do an example again. So I'm going to do that same example I just did. I'm going to start with 11 um, in base 10, and let's convert this to base 2. So we recursively divide 2 into here and take the remainder. So if we divide, so let's, let's do that here. So 11 equals... 5 times 2 plus 1, and then we, and so now what we have is, we have this 5, so we divide 2 into 5, so 5 is 2 times 2 plus 1, and now we have this 2, we could say 2 is um, 1 times 2, plus 0, and now we have this 1, and we want to divide 2 into it. 1 is 0 times 2 plus 1. So this is the, uh, um, two to the, this is the 1's digit, 2 to the 0. This is the 2's the digit, I guess, 2 to the 1st. This is 2 squared, and this is 2 cubed, 
And so this tells us that the number is in base 2 is 1, 1, 0, 1. Let's do an example with base 26. Here's a number, 2, 2, 1, 7, 0, 7, 9, 4, 7, and we will recursively divide 26 into that number. So we take that number and we divide 26 into it, and we get 26 times 8, 5, 2, 7, 2, 2, 8. Doesn't matter, but what matters is the remainder of 19. So we go up to our, our chart, and 19 is a T. So we put a T there. Now we divide 26 into 8, 5, 2, 7, 2, 2, 8, and we get a quotient, 3, 2, 7, 9, 7, 0, times 26, plus a remainder of 8. And that 8 is an I. Next, we divide 26 into a quotient, 3, 2, 7, 9, 7, 0, and we get 1, 2, 6, 1, 4 times 26 with a remainder of 6. So we go up in our table, and a 6 is a G. Next, we take 26 and we divide it into our previous quotient, 1, 2, 6, 1, 4, and we get 485. So, 48, so 485 times 26 plus a remainder of 4. So 4 is E. And then we keep going. We're almost done now. We take 26, we divide it into 485, our previous quotient, we get 18. So 485 is 18 plus 26 with a remainder of 17. And a 17 is an, oops, is an R. We got one more. We divide 26 into 18. The quotient is 0, and the remainder is 18. And an 18 is an S. In other words, suppose that we receive a message where each letter is encoded with a number, and that number is converted from base 26 to base 10, and we get 22170797, then we can decode that and we get the message T-I-G-E-R-S. In summary, we've seen how to take a word that is a string of letters, convert that into a string of numbers in the obvious fashion, and then turn that string of numbers into a base 10 number, and we've also seen how to undo that process. There's just one problem. Suppose that we want to send this in secret. Like if it's a password, I don't want to just type that into a website in plain text. And that's what cryptography is all about. Though he surely wasn't the first to do so, Julius Caesar, who lived in the first century BC, used an encryption device called a cipher in his private correspondences. And yes, he actually did this in real life. He would send encrypted messages that were meant to be secret, and they would look something like this. RZ, WKDWV, VKDUS. He would just take... Now, all he was doing here was just taking the alphabet, A up to Z, and just shifting it by three letters. So let's see how to decode this. So what we do is we take this, this first letter, R, which, and we find that, and we find what it, three letters earlier is, that's an O. So a Z is a W, and then a W corresponds to a T, K is down here, that, that's a H, D is A, W is T again, and then V is S, and then another V is S, K is again an H, D is A again, U is, where was that, U is R, and S is, is P. So the decrypted message in this case would be, ow, that's sharp. What, too soon? Now this may seem ridiculous, because you'd think if he really wanted to keep a message a secret, that this is a really easy code to crack. And of course it was. 
But remember, this is way before computers. But not just that, it was way before most people were literate. So if he were giving this to a messenger and having the messenger ride his horse to deliver it, you know, perhaps the messenger would get intercepted by some bad guys. But there's a good chance that the messenger and the bad guys couldn't read. Or if they could, they would look at this and say, oh, that's got to be some strange foreign language that we don't know how to speak. And they wouldn't even bother to try to decode it. Something as simple as shifting by three letters. And even if they knew it was a shift by some number of letters or some trick like that, there's many, many things that they, it could be, and it's not clear how to start, just if you want to do it by hand. This crypto system is called the Caesar Cipher, perhaps the second most famous thing named after Julius Caesar, after, of course, the salad. And even though it's pretty worthless in today's society, due to computers, it's still worth defining so we can see what the main components are. So it takes a key, which is a natural number K, an encryption function, E of X, that takes in a letter and spits out a different letter, and a decryption function, D of Y. And these are defined as follows. E of X takes in a letter and spits out X plus K mod 26. In our example, K was 3. And D of Y is equal to Y minus K mod 26. We, of course, we first associate each letter to a number in Z26, that is the set of numbers 0 up to 25, as we did before. And to see an example of this, let's suppose that K equals 18. Then we can encrypt the letter R as follows. We take R upstairs and we say, well, that's equal to 17. So we add 17 plus 18 mod 26, which is 35 mod 26, which is just 9 mod 26. And using our table, we see that that is J. Now let's decrypt the letter L. So let's do this in reverse. First, we look at our table and we see that L is equal to 11. So we take 11 and we subtract K, which is 18, mod 26, and that is negative 7. And mod 26, that is 19. And that is T, as we can see from our table. Of course, we can do a more complicated encryption function. For example, consider the following. So E is a function from Z26 to Z26 that takes a letter or number, X, and just multiplies it by 5 mod 26. Now this works because the function E is injective and therefore bijective. And the only reason why it's bijective is because the GCD of 26 and 5 is equal to 1. If we took something that was not relatively prime, like we took 2, then we would not get a bijection. Everything in the image would be even. And it's, it's similar if we take a multiplicative factor that is not relatively prime to 26. I'm not going to prove that, but I'll, I'll let you verify that for yourself. And hopefully that seems reasonable. Let's encrypt the letter R, which is 17, with this function. So E of 17 is just 5 times 17 mod 26, which is 85, which is 7. And 7, I think, in our table was equal to H. But that's really not that important. To decrypt a message, or I should say a letter, we just multiply by 21 mod 26. So to encrypt, we multiply by 5, and to decrypt, we multiply by 21. Why? You know, this is probably a bad example, because the, the answer is not, and I want to emphasize not, because 5 plus 21 equals 26. That's merely a coincidence. 
The answer is because in Z26, the multiplicative inverse of 5 is 21. Now, what do I mean by multiplicative inverse? Well, let me go back to the regular integers, or I should say the, the regular rational numbers, to answer that. Well, let's consider 5. The multiplicative inverse of 5 in the rational numbers, or in the real numbers, is 1 fifth, because that's the thing that you multiply to get back to 1. Well, what's so special about 1? Well, 1 is the multiplicative identity. What does that mean? Well, that means that 1 times any x equals x for all real numbers x. Like if we're dealing with matrices, say 2 by 2 matrices, and we have, so we have a 2 by 2 matrix A, we want to multiply by its by A inverse to get back to the identity matrix. And here, I equals 1, 0, 0, 1 is, is the matrix identity, at least the 2 by 2 matrix identity, because I times v equals v for all vectors v. Now, if we're dealing with addition, the additive identity of 5 is what we add to 5 to get the identity element, which is negative 5. So here, 0 is the additive identity because 0 plus x equals x for all real numbers x. This is the tip of the iceberg of the field of abstract algebra. But going back to Z26, turns out that 21 is the multiplicative inverse because it's the thing that you multiply by 5 to get 1. In other words, 5 times 21 is equivalent to 105 mod 26. Now 26 divides evenly into 104. So 105 is equivalent to 1 mod 26. It's a basic number theory fact that k in Zn has a multiplicative inverse if and only if n and k are relatively prime. The GCD is 1. And hopefully that seems intuitive to you, and the same reason why it's hopefully intuitive that e of x up here is a bijection if and only if um, n and k, in this case 26 and 5, are relatively prime. So let's do an example, because this fact doesn't actually tell us how to compute the inverse, and there, there are ways, but it's, it's not like there's an easy or obvious pattern. So, so let me just do n equals 9 and k equals 4. So we want to know what's the multiplicative inverse of, of k. So k inverse is, is what? So let's just start writing down multiples of k until we get to one that is 1 mod 9. So 0, that's not 1 mod 9. 4, that's not 1 mod 9, nor is 8, nor is 12, that's just 3 mod 9. Um, 16, that's um, 7 mod 9. 20, that's 2 mod 9. 24. 4, that is 18, that's 6 mod 9, uh, we're running out of options, um, 28, okay, there we go, 28 is 1 mod 9, because 9 is a multiple of 27, so in other words, 4 times 7 is equivalent to 1 mod 9, so the multiplicative inverse of 4 is 7 mod 9. Let's make things harder. Because if we think about Julius Caesar's original encryption method, it, it was really simple. It just shifted everything by 3. If, if you had a bad guy that was literate, and they knew that he was doing some sort of encrypted message, it seems like it's possible that they could crack the code. However, if you multiply by 5, things get a lot more jumbled. If you do something like this, if you multiply by 5 and then shift, 
they get more jumbled still. So here's a function. Here's an encrypting function. E of x equals 5x plus 3 mod 26. In other words, what we're doing with an input x is first multiplying by 5 and then adding 3. To decrypt the message m, we need to undo these in the opposite order. So for each digit or each letter k, we first subtract 3 and then we multiply by the multiplicative inverse of 5 which is 21. So the decryption function is thus d of x equals 21 times x minus 3 mod 26. The ciphers that we've seen from the basic Caesar cipher, which is just a shift, to the most recent one where we multiply by 5 and add 3, that's actually an example of an affine cipher, e of x equals ax plus b. All of these have a major weakness. They're all called character or monographic ciphers. All copies of the same letter get encrypted the same way. Formally, that's e of xi equals e of xj implies xi equals xj. We're just saying that this function is bijective. Now, if we're trying to decode this by hand, or even with the use of a computer, um, it, may be it may be tricky to figure out what A and B are. So you can always do just a, a complete search and just try them all. And let's see, we have 26 possibilities for B, and then how, how many for A? Now remember that the, the GCD of A and N has to be equal to 1, so A can't be even. It also can't be 13, because that's a factor of 26. And it, um, but it can be anything else. So that's going to be 26 minus 13 minus 1, which is going to be... Tw so there's 12 possibilities. So there's 12 times 26. Um, so that's... What is that? Somewhere in the neighborhood of 300-ish possibilities. A computer could do that easily. Could just check every single one of them and see if, if any of them if any of them work and which one. However, the affine ciphers are just a small possibility of a set of all character ciphers. Really any permutation of the letters works and there are 26 permutations of the letters or of the numbers 0 up to 25. And there's going to be even more if we allow things like spaces and special characters, like punctuation. And 26 is approximately, that's 4.03, so 26 factorial times 10 to the 26. That's huge. That's bigger than a mole. And so if we pick a random permutation and use that as a cipher, basically no computer can check all of those and just do it by brute force. So does that mean that it's safe, picking a random permutation as a cipher? Well, unfortunately not. And here's why. If the message is long, then the private key can be deduced by analyzing letter frequencies. So in the English alphabet, E is by far the most common letter, followed by T. You know, I always learned that S was the most common consonant growing up, but maybe that was just wrong. Because I did a Google search, and it seems to, there seems to be a consensus that T is more common than S. So go figure. I don't know. Maybe language has changed. I wonder if anyone else remembers that wrong piece of information as well. But anyways, what you can do is with a statistical analysis, you can see what letters appear more than others, and you can get a pretty good idea as to what things like, you know, which letter is going to be an E. And once you have that, you can get a pretty good idea as to what letters, you know, what some of the letters next to it are. And even if we don't have an affine cipher, if you have a random permutation, if you get enough of the letters uh, nailed down, you can probably figure out what the code is. So this, this is a major weakness, and this is why these, these uh, monographic ciphers just really aren't used in practice. But they were very useful for thousands of years. 
A more sophisticated cipher to the monographic ones are the block or polygraphic ciphers. And these encrypt blocks of plain text letters to blocks of ciphertext letters of the same length. One such system was developed by Blaise de Vigenera in 1585, and it's called the Vigenera cipher. We'll introduce this by an example. So once again, here's our table for reference. And let's encrypt the message engineering, which in base 26, it's 11 letters, and here they are. 4, 13, 6, 8, 13, 4, 4, 17, 8, 13, 6. And we will use the key ROCKS, R-O-C-K-S, which is 17, 14, 2, 10, 18. So this is called a block cipher, because what you basically do is instead of sh shifting every letter by a, a, a single K, we will shift blocks of five letters by 17, 14, 2, 10, and 18, respectively. So once again, it's easiest to see this with an example. So here's engineering. We will break this up into length five blocks, because that's the length of our key rocks. And then we have something left over. So engineering in base 26. Here it is, the sequence of numbers. Rocks in base 26. We Put that underneath, so we have this repeating length 5 key that goes underneath each length 5 block of engineering. And now all we're going to do is just add these up. So 4 plus 27 is 21, 13 plus 14 is 27, which is 1 mod 26, 6 plus 2 is 8, 8 plus 10 is 18, 13 plus 18 is 31, which is 5, and so forth. So here that is, the sum of PI plus KI for each entry. It's 21, 1, 8, 18, 5, 21, 18, 19, 18, 5, 23. And the letters are V, B, I, S, F, V, S, T, S, F, X. So that's how you encrypt with this cipher. Let's now see how to decrypt. Let's also do this by an example, and we will decrypt a different message, T, Z, G, W, K, F, B, V, S, Y, W, F, U. So here I, I am pre-processing this into blocks of length five. I'm not necessarily saying that the message is a length five letter uh, word followed by a length five word and then a length three word. Not at all. This is just how we process it. And so in base 26, this length 13 message is this string of numbers. So before I tell you that I'm using the key rocks, let's think about how you would actually handle this if you intercepted this message from an enemy and you needed to decrypt this. That's a much harder question than just running a, and looking at letter frequencies like we did with a monographic cipher because you don't know what the length of the key is. And it's not clear that there is a good way to do that. Well, it turns out that this has been cracked. There, there are algorithms, once again, using some advanced statistical analysis of the letter frequencies to figure out what the length of the key is. And once you have the length of the key, there are advanced ways to figure out what the key is and, and how to decode it. So unfortunately, this is not secure. But it's also secure enough that you probably can't really do it by hand. Okay, so let's, let's do this. So we are going to decrypt this message using the same key, rocks. So we take our message and we break it into length 5 chunks, and then we have something left over. Then we convert the ciphertext into numbers. I'll call those CIs for ciphertext. We write down the numbers corresponding to the key underneath. And to undo this encryption, we have to subtract the key from the ciphertext to get the plain text, letter by letter. So if we do that, 19 minus 17 is 2, 
25 minus 14, 11. 6 minus 2 is 4. 22 minus 10 is 12. It's a little bit harder when we get to, uh, we're subtracting a bigger number from a small number. 10 minus 18 is negative 8, which negative 8 mod 26 is 18. And we keep going 14, 13, 19, 8, 6, 4, 17, 18. Okay, so what is this secret message? Well, 2, that is a C. 11 is an L. 4 is an E. 12 is an M. 18 is an S. Okay, Vanna, would you like to solve the puzzle? Clemson Tigers, once again. Same message we saw in the beginning. In conclusion, the ciphers that we've seen in this lecture are all symmetric. And by that I mean decryption is the opposite, or formally the inverse function, of encryption. Not only is the same key used for encryption and decryption, but that key needs to be kept private. This is a serious problem if two entities want to send a message across an insecure channel, like a customer and an online bank. Well, for multiple reasons. So, for example, if we're just using the ciphers, crypto systems in this lecture, then they can, then if you were to send that in plain text across the channel, someone could intercept that and run those statistical analyses and decode them. But even if they but, but even more basic, how is your bank going to send you the encryption function? You know, are they going to do it by mail? That's not a very good idea. Are you going to go in in person? That's not very practical. So what we would like somehow is for the key to not have to be kept in private. So wouldn't it be great if... There could be, a, if I could communicate with my bank and the bank could send me a, a private key and only I could use it. Other people could see it, but it wouldn't do them any good. That's a whole other type of crypto system. However, before we get into the details of some of those systems, I should mention that there are secure symmetric crypto systems like the popular Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So this is sort of like what we, we've seen where decryption and encryption are the same except inverses of each other. However, they can't be cracked in the same way that all the ones we've seen so far can. Another option is what's called an asymmetric cipher. In an asymmetric cipher, there are two distinct keys. There's a public key, which is used for encryption, and there's a private key, which is used for decryption. The instructions for encrypting a message can be made public without compromising the security. Now, for a long time, for many decades, it was not clear whether a system like this should exist. And since no one had come up with one, it seemed like it was just a big pipe dream. However, in the 1970s, three MIT computer scientists actually came up with such an asymmetric crypto system, and it now bears their name, or at least the abbreviations, RSA. This is still used today widely in products that I, I guarantee that you've used for things like data encryption when you send your password across the channel. So we'll learn all about this in a few upcoming lectures. Actually, I think in the next lecture. So stay with us.